Chapter 3 The Strange Guide In his frustration, Siggy recalled the dark-haired boy who had stuck out his tongue. He entered the waiting room and found the youngster sprawling on the windowsill. The boy, who looked about his age, stared at Siggy out of surprisingly blue eyes. "'Can you tell me where the Ettinger farm is?' Siggy asked him. "'Wouldn't you like to know?' <laughs> The boy snickered like someone who was telling somebody who was telling a joke. Do you know where it is? Siggy said. Siggy asked again. Of course. The boy's tongue flicked from one corner of his mouth to the other. I'd be obliged if you'd tell me. How much can you give me? The boy held out his hand. You mean money? Yeah, money. How about a mark? Siggy countered. Siggy parted with a whole week's allowance. Now tell me. You won't find it, the boy claimed. If you give me another mark, I'll show you the way. Siggy felt cheated, but parted with the second mark. The boy slipped the money into his checkered shirt pocket and then shuffled outside. Are they heavy? he asked, pointing at the suitcases. It's a rough road, uphill all the way. Yanking a bicycle from the station's rack, he added, if you give me another mark, you can use my bike. Why, you're a highway robber! Siggy felt his anger rise. Steffi poked his side. Give him the money. She whispered. Aloud, she said, I'm the Steffi Edinger, and this is my brother, Sig. What's your name? <laughs> Wouldn't you like to know? He teased. Siggy grudged. Um, Siggy grudgingly parted with a third mark. I suppose you want a fourth mark for telling us your name. How did you guess? The boy held out his hand. Siggy took a deep breath before answering. It didn't take a fortune teller, he said, but three marks is all you'll get out of me. He heaved the luggage onto the rickety bike. If you don't get give me any more, then I won't tell you who I am. The boy te um, threatened his jaw thrust out in a pout. Big deal. Siggy pushed the bike over to the curbstone. Steffi's red suitcase rested in the rack behind the seat. His own blue one perched precariously between the handlebar and saddle. I won't show you the way, the strange boy shouted. Give me my bike back. Nothing doing, Siggy said. We paid you. Now lead the way. The boy scuffed on ahead of Siggy and Steffi. On the rutted, rock-strewn road, the bo bike pushed hard. Siggy stopped once and wiped his perspiring forehead. For three marks, you could help me push, he told their strange guy. The boy humphed. Please help my... Steffi pleaded. Please help my brother just a little while. The boy sneered back at her. I don't listen to dumb girls. All right, Steffi had said. I'll push the bike myself. See? She grasped the handlebar. Before Siggy knew what was happening, the boy pounced on Steffi. Ouch! Steffi screamed. The bike toppled. Suitcases tumbled as the boy threw Steffi to the ground. Siggy helped his sister into the shade of an oak. Don't you ever hurt my sister again, he warned the boy. Steffi's knee was skinned. To cheer her, Siggy turned on the transistor radio in his pocket. At the first sounds, their guide looked about. Do you hear music? he asked. Where is it coming from? The way he cocked his head was almost comical. Steffi giggled between moans. Wouldn't he like to know? She held out her hand in begging fish fashion. That would be a mark, please. The strange boy ran towards her, dark-faced and angry. Steffi screamed, He's going to hit me! No, he's not. Siggy jumped in front of her and the boy retreated. We'd better follow him, Steffi cautioned, or he'll run off. Siggy put the suitcases back on the bike. He noticed a pond that gleamed like a blue eye in the meadow. He'd remember the pond. It would make a great swimming hole. He wouldn't mind sharing it with the frog whose sleepy croaking sounded through the countryside. As they entered a stand of cool fir trees, their guide turned around. <clears throat> If you show me where the music came from, I'll push the bike the rest of the way, he offered. Siggy took the little radio from his pocket. It runs on batteries, he explained. The boy, his mouth hanging open in amazement, 
reached for Siggy's radio. I'll push if you give me that battery thing. Siggy gulped. That wasn't the bargain. You promised to push, and push you will. He grabbed the boy and made him push the bike. You're mean. I hate you. Why don't you go back to where you came from? The boy pushed uphill, grumbling every step of the way. Siggy studied the scenery. Fir woods, flower-carpeted meadows, roller coaster fields. The fragrance of freshly cut hay. Plants alive with the hum of bees. City life and pollution seemed far away. The children rounded a turn, and there stood a farmhouse. Its whitewashed stucco and green shutters looked cozy enough, and its deep overhanging eaves and the sloping roof made it fit right in with the mountain scenery. The house and the barn were built together, with the house facing south, and the barn with its haymow facing the road on the north. Siggy, Steffi, and the boy reached the north end of the building first. A steep ramp led up to the haymow. <clears throat> the boy pushed the bike partway up this ramp and then veered into the farmyard on the house's sun-flooded west side. The voices of geese, turkeys, chicken, and sheep sounded from the poultry house and fenced in patches in the fruit garden. The boy dropped the bike <clears throat> and ran back to the road. Hey, you forgot your bike! Siggy picked up the suitcases. <clears throat> what a character. I hope we've seen the last of him, Steffi said. Siggy nodded. He lugged the suitcases to the front door and looked for the doorbell. There was none. Siggy knocked, but nobody answered. The old-fashioned door handle did not move. The house was obviously locked. Let's try the other door, Sig, Steffi said stepping up to an entrance between the house and the wagon sh and wagon shed. Pulling it open, they entered a dark breezeway with loose, loose boards creaking underfoot. They felt their way along a stone wall to a higher level of the house. Steffi whispered, This place is spooky. Spooky and smelly. You can tell the barn is near. Siggy's finger touched a wooden door. The handle moved. He pushed it open, and they found themselves on the threshold of the cool, dim hall. A staircase led both upstairs and down to the cellar. Is anybody home? Steffi whispered. I guess it's all right if we peek into the rooms. Maybe they're taking an after-dinner nap. Siggy fought a creepy feeling. They'll be glad to know we're here. He passed the staircase and eased open the doors to a large kitchen and to an equally large living room. Steffi opened the last door. Look, Sig! I found the larder! She squealed. I'm starved! What about you? famished. In the larder they grasped at bowls filled with milk. They gasped at bowls filled with milk. Boards dotted with miniature cheeses, baskets heaped with eggs, cocks brimming with cheese, cocks brimming with cheese, jars jammed with fruit, shelves loaded with crusty bread. A wire rack heaped with golden pastries still warm to the touch activated Siggy's taste buds. Steffi's ton tongue moistened her lips. Can we help ourselves, Sig? Aunt Matilda wouldn't want us to go hungry at her house, Siggy reasoned. I know Mama wouldn't want little v Vetus to, to starve if he came to visit us. Steffi opened the connecting door to the kitchen. Let's sit down, Sig. My knee hurts. She carried the bowl. Siggy, she carried two mouthfuls to the white scrub table. Siggy followed with the pastry rack. They drank milk from the from the bowls and flattened the pastry mountain in no time at all.